Hi, my name is Jade and I'm a medical student in Leicester. In this video, you'll learn everything you need to know about diabetes. Let's begin. Diabetes mellitus is a condition whereby either a deficiency of insulin or a reduced sensitivity to insulin results in high levels of serum glucose and a group of metabolic disorders. In type 1 diabetes, there is autoimmune destruction of the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans found in the pancreas. This results in a reduction of insulin. In type 2 diabetes, there is a relative insulin deficiency due to an excess of adipose tissue and cells have a reduced sensitivity to insulin. So glucose molecules are unable to be absorbed into cells and they remain in the blood instead. High levels of glucose in the blood is called hyperglycemia. Diabetes mellitus is not the same as diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is a condition caused by either reduced ADH release from the pituitary gland or when the kidneys become less sensitive to ADH. This causes patients to produce copious amounts of dilute urine. Patients with type 1 diabetes can present to A&E with symptoms of DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis, or they may present to primary care with symptoms like polyuria, polydipsia, general malaise, weight loss, and abdominal pain. Patients with type 2 diabetes are often asymptomatic and picked up incidentally, but some patients may present with polyuria, polydipsia, and recurrent infections such as UTIs or candidiasis. Some investigations that may help in the diagnosis of diabetes include HbA1c, which is a measurement of the average glycemic control over the lifespan of a red cell, about three months, BMs, which are a quick bedside test used to measure glucose levels in the blood, fasting and random glucose levels, or an oral glucose tolerance test in suspected gestational diabetes or when other investigations are inconclusive. In suspected DKA, you would also measure urine glucose and ketone levels, and you may consider testing for C-related peptide, which would be reduced in type 1 diabetes, and diabetes-specific autoantibodies. It is also important to screen for end-organ damage, including diabetic retinopathy, diabetic foot disease, and neuropathy. Diabetic retinopathy can be screened for by doing a slit lamp examination. Diabetic foot disease can be screened for by doing a diabetic foot examination, including using a monofilament to look for diabetic neuropathy. Note that HbA1c should be used cautiously in patients with red cell disorders, including sickle cell anemia. For a diagnosis of diabetes to be made, patients should have symptoms of diabetes with one abnormal clinical result or if they are asymptomatic, their clinical results have to be abnormal and suggestive of diabetes on two occasions. A clinical result suggestive of diabetes can either be a fasting glucose level of 7 millimoles per litre or above, a random glucose level of 11.1 millimoles per litre or above, or an HbA1c of 48 millimoles per mole or above, an HbA1c between 42 and 47 millimoles per mole is referred to as pre-diabetes. People with pre-diabetes should be closely monitored and advised on lifestyle measures such as weight loss to prevent blood glucose levels reaching diabetic levels. Type 1 diabetes is treated with insulin as, by definition, it is an insulin deficiency. Insulin injection sites should be rotated to prevent lipodystrophy, which refers to fibrosis and damage of the tissue underlying the injection site. The first line management for type 2 diabetes mellitus is lifestyle management, exercise and diet advice, including increasing fibre, avoiding carbohydrates that have a high glycemic index and reducing intake of saturated and trans fats. If lifestyle measures do not improve glycemic control, the first-line treatment is metformin tablets. Metformin is a biguanide which works by increasing sensitivity of cells to insulin and by decreasing gluconeogenesis. 
it cannot be given to a patient with an EGFR of less than 30 as there is a risk of lactic acidosis. If, after initiating an oral medication, the HbA1c is still above 58 millimoles per mole, then a second drug should be added. Second-line treatment options include sulfonylureas, gliptins, glitazones, or SGLT2 inhibitors. Sulfonylureas, like glicoside, work by stimulating insulin release. They are associated with a risk of hypoglycemia and weight gain. Glyptins are DPP4 inhibitors and work by increasing the secretion of incretin, which inhibits glucagon. They are associated with a risk of pancreatitis. Pioglitazone works by promoting fat and muscle glucose uptake. Side effects include weight gain, fractures and fluid retention. It is contraindicated in patients with a history of bladder cancer or heart failure. SGLT2 inhibitors, like dapagliflozin, increase the excretion of glucose in the urine and are therefore associated with recurrent UTIs. GLP-1 mimetics, like exenatide, can be given to patients who have a BMI of 35 or above, as a common side effect is weight loss. They work by increasing insulin secretion and decreasing glucagon secretion. If a dual drug therapy fails to lower the HbA1c, then triple therapy or insulin on its own can be trialled. The target HbA1c for patients with diabetes mellitus is less than 48 millimoles per mole or 53 millimoles per mole if the patient's on hypoglycemic drugs. The HbA1c should be checked every three to six months in patients with type 1 diabetes. It is checked every three to six months in patients with type 2 diabetes as well until the patients are medically stable and then it's done six monthly. Once a patient is diagnosed with diabetes, they may be required to notify the DVLA depending on the severity of the disease, their treatment and the type of license they use. All patients with insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus must inform the DVLA. Patients with diabetes should be advised that if they become unwell, they should increase the frequency of their blood glucose monitoring to about 4 hourly and ensure adequate fluid intake, including sugary drinks, if they're struggling to eat. They must continue to take their hypoglycemic medications, including insulin, even if they're not eating, as the stress response due to being ill means that cortisol levels are high and blood glucose levels will increase too. It can sometimes be tricky to manage a diabetic patient for surgery. Diabetic patients tend to get the first slots for the day. For type 1 diabetics having major surgery or with poor glycemic control, the basal insulin should be reduced by 20% the night before and on the morning of the surgery, their short-acting insulin should be omitted and a variable rate insulin infusion should be given instead via a syringe driver. A variable rate insulin infusion is a combination of sodium chloride and ACT rapid, which is a rapid acting insulin. Once patients are nil by mouth, a dextrose infusion should also be given alongside insulin and BMs should be checked every two hours to prevent hypoglycemia. After the operation, once patients start eating and drinking again, they can be restarted on their normal insulin regime. They can administer their normal subcut insulin injection 20 minutes before their first meal. Then the insulin infusion should be stopped 30 to 60 minutes after the meal. For type 2 diabetics, management for surgery is very similar to type 1 diabetics, especially if they are insulin dependent. If their diabetes is diet controlled, then no action is required. If they take oral hypoglycemics like sulfonylureas, pioglitazone, gliptins, SGLT2 inhibitors or acarbose, then these must be stopped 24 hours before an elective procedure and patients should be started on a variable rate insulin infusion alongside 5% dextrose to prevent hypoglycemia while nil by mouth. Oral hypoglycemics should only be restarted once a patient is eating and drinking again. Metformin can be taken until the morning of their surgery where they should skip their dose to reduce the risk of lactic acidosis. If diabetes is triggered by pregnancy, 
It's called gestational diabetes. Some risk factors for developing gestational diabetes include a BMI over 30, personal or family history of gestational diabetes, being of South Asian or Afro-Caribbean ethnicity, and a previous macrosomic baby. Patients deemed to be at risk of developing gestational diabetes will have two oral glucose tolerance tests, one at booking and another between 24 to 28 weeks gestation. If the glucose levels are less than 7 millimoles per litre and there are no complications like macrosomia, then patients can be advised to try diet and lifestyle changes to improve their glucose levels. If, after two weeks, their glucose levels are still too high, then metformin is given. If the glucose levels are between 6 and 6.9 millimoles per litre on OGTT and there are complications, then insulin must be given alongside lifestyle advice. If the glucose levels are above 7 millimoles per litre, regardless of whether or not there are complications, then insulin is to be given at diagnosis, although lifestyle advice should also be given. Gestational diabetes is dangerous as it can result in complications like polyhydramnios, preeclampsia, miscarriage or stillbirth, malformations including neural tube defects and neonatal hypoglycemia. Women with pre-existing diabetes that are considering getting pregnant should be advised to lose weight if their BMI is over 27 and to achieve satisfactory glucose control before conception that is, their HbA1c should be less than 48 millimoles per mole. Metformin can be continued, but all other oral anti-diabetic drugs should be stopped and substituted with insulin therapy. Most oral anti-diabetic drugs should not be restarted until after breastfeeding. They should start taking 5 milligrams of folic acid straight away and continue it until week 12 of pregnancy. They should start taking aspirin 75 milligrams from week 12 of pregnancy to prevent preeclampsia. They will require a detailed anomaly scan at 20 weeks due to the increased rate of malformations in babies to diabetic mothers. In my next video, I will cover complications of diabetes in more detail, including diabetic emergencies like DKA, HHS and hypoglycemia, as well as common complications like diabetic neuropathy, diabetic foot disease, and diabetic nephropathy. Thanks for watching.